Welcome to lecture 18 on Aristotle's ethics. So today I think you'll start to see how Aristotle's overall philosophical system comes together. So let's jump in with a discussion on the differences between Aristotle's ethics and modern conceptions of ethics. So I have here a picture of a gestalt image. Hopefully some of you have seen this before. It's known as the duck rabbit. Depending on which way you view this image, you can see it as a duck or you can see it as a rabbit. In a way, the difference between Aristotle's ethical system and modern views of ethics inspired by divine command theory and then inspired by Kantian ethics can feel like a duck rabbit. It can almost feel as if it's a complete different shift in perspective so that even though in a way you're thinking about the same thing, you're thinking about ethical action, they are characterized in completely two different ways. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between Aristotle's ethics and our modern conception of ethics. So just to start off, Western civilization has had a history of thinking about moral action in terms of divine rules. So the Ten Commandments provides the clearest example of a list of commands, things that you should do and things that you shouldn't do. And these rules are taken as the framework for good behavior. Now if you disobey the rules, then you're subject to punishment. And punishment can be both a external sanction, you know, punishment from God, punishment from your community, but it can also be an internal sanction, something that you, you know, haven't in a way lived up to the proper ideals. Moreover, the divine rules can often seem to conflict with self-interest so that you would prefer to perform a certain action, but you realize that this action is in conflict with rules and that so shouldn't be done. Now since the scientific revolution, the appeal to God as a ground of morality has been called into question. And in contemporary society, there's not a universally agreed ground to morality. Immanuel Kant, a figure in the 18th century, tried to ground morality in reasons so that it would have more universal appeal. And Kantian ethics carries over a lot of the framework of earlier appeals to divine rules. So what I want to do is just focus on three differences between Aristotle's ethics and this more contemporary Kantian perspective. So the first difference is that for Aristotle, action matters a lot more than intention. But for us, for those inspired by Kant, we think of intention as being the locus of moral evaluation. So suppose a friend of mine has had a recent success and we want to go out to celebrate. So we go out to a very nice restaurant and I order a very nice bottle of wine and we drink it to celebrate. Now unbeknownst to me, my friend's in recovery and this small act of what I intended to be a kind act to congratulate him on his success led him back into a period in which he was addicted. So here, the locus of moral evaluation, we would think, would fall on the intention. I intended to do something, and I should be praiseworthy for, for this act. I paid for this very expensive bottle of wine to celebrate his success. But for Aristotle, he has a different perspective that what matters is not so much the intention, but the actual action that one performs. So we can see this in a passage in Book 1, Chapter 8 of the Nicomachean Ethics, where Aristotle is talking about the external goods. So he, he says here that happiness requires the external goods as well. He says it's impossible to do noble acts, impossible or not easy, to do noble acts without the proper equipment. In many actions, we use friends and riches and political power as instruments. And there are some things, the lack of which takes the luster from blessedness, as good birth, satisfactory children, or beauty. For the man who is very ugly in appearance or ill-born or solitary and childless is hardly happy. And perhaps a man would be still less so if he had thoroughly bad children or friends or had lost good children or friends by death. As we say then, happiness seems to depend on this sort of prosperity as well. So Aristotle's idea here is that to live the ethically good life, to experience happiness, this proper state of ethical evaluation depends on things like good looks, influence, family, good children, and so on, where tragedy or chance can take these things away. Correspondingly, a second difference is that from the modern perspective, the thought is that just desserts, or the ethically good life, or what's appropriate for the ethical life, can be compensated in the afterlife. So afterlife here is to compensate for chance. Now, for Aristotle, chance is a real problem for Arete, for excellence, and for eudaimonia. And the afterlife, even though they admitted that there may be an afterlife in which people exist in some, 
in some sort of state that's similar uh, to the afterlife, that afterlife can still be governed by chance. In a way, being born into a bad family would still affect one in the afterlife. So this is a very different perspective. Now Kant tried to tie mor moral action to human dignity so that when you act in the way that reason commanded, you were exercising human dignity. Now there is a real question here for moderns. It's like, why be moral when being moral can conflict so deeply with one's self-interest? But for Aristotle, that is not a problem because morality is tied to one's self-interest through the pursuit of the good life. The third difference that I want to highlight is that morality is autonomous. And we've seen this in earlier lectures, is that for Kant, that mor moral action needs to be from a perspective that's independent of your desires. Now, for Aristotle, the idea is that, no, we need to first figure out what it is to live well, what eudaimonia is. And then ethical virtue, erite, is what helps to achieve eudaimonia. So there's no gap between one's self-interest and what morality requires. Okay, so what we see for Aristotle is that the pursuit of happiness is the chief goal for ethical life. So Aristotle would think in a way that Kantian ethics is just bizarre. From Kant's perspective, happiness is external to an ethical perspective because you're reasoning about what reason requires. And so you are putting distance between your desires and what the requirements of morality are. Now for Aristotle, happiness, desire, the satisfaction of human desire, isn't external from the ethical perspective. This is a difference between what grounds ethical action. For Kant, it's grounded in reason, and for Aristotle, what grounds morality is eudaimonia. So I want to point out two consequences about this grounding of morality in eudaimonia. The first consequence is that Aristotle thinks that when it comes to moral action, there aren't precise rules. So Aristotle writes in Nicomachean Ethics, Book 1, Chapter 3, he says that it's the mark of an educated person to look for precision in each class of things just so far as the nature of the subject matter permits. And so in the case of ethical action, you're going to be in very particular circumstances that have many different competing criteria to be satisfied. And you have to figure out, all right, how am I best going to perform a good act in these particular circumstances? And Aristotle is wise in thinking that, look, you're not going to be able to describe general rules that are going to determine what you ought to do in all the very many situations that people find themselves in. So the second consequence that I want to focus on here is that eudaimonia can't be understood from an external perspective. So if you do not understand human health at all, suppose in a way you're an alien and you just do not get it, then you really wouldn't understand the motivation that people have for certain kinds of activities like jogging and cycling and swimming. Why do people do them? We can't say in a way that these you can't specify a goal that can be understood independently of the activities. Jogging, swimming, and cycling are things that people do that are constitutive of health. They provide pleasure in themselves, but they also are what a healthy person does, a healthy person exercises. In a similar fashion, the moral life on Aristotle's conception can't be understood apart from living the moral life. A person who is vicious, who has a vicious character, is going to derive pleasure and pains from vicious actions, and they're not going to understand ethically good actions. In contrast, the moral individual, in Aristotle's view, derives pleasure and pains from moral actions. So this is why, for example, that Aristotle says that young individuals shouldn't attend his lectures on ethics. So he writes, he says, a young man is not a proper hearer of lectures on political science. Now remember here, political science is ethical theory writ large for the state. For, Aristotle says, he is inexperienced in actions that occur in life, but its discussions start from these actions and are about these actions. So he wants people who are engaged in discussions of ethics and political science to have already lived life, to have already to already to have experienced the pleasures and pains that come from certain kinds of actions. Right? He says that people that that do not have right, these actions, that the knowledge right, that they would gain from listening to the lectures provides no profit at all. He says, but to those who desire and act according to the logos, who desire and act according to the proper form of good action, knowledge about such matters will be of great benefit. 
So this is important here because what Aristotle is saying is he's saying, look, the way we should conceive of ethics, of d ethical discussions, is not as providing, in a way, reasons we have to engage in ethical action. That would be foolish. Rather, the goal is to, to get a systematic understanding of what ethical behavior is about, which would help us better situate what we, in a way, already know. So in the background here, there is a hint of the Mino paradox, like how can you learn to be virtuous if you know absolutely nothing about virtue? All right, so let's think about the connection between happiness and human nature. So Aristotle says that if there's some end of action which we desire for its own sake, that this end must be the chief good. And he's going to identify this with happiness. So his thought there is that whatever happiness is, it's going to be the end. It's going to be something that human action aims at that is desired for its own sake. So obviously this is tied to what in fact people desire. So there are two challenges to this claim that Aristotle makes. The first challenge comes from the possibility, the conceptual possibility that there's no ultimate end in action. That for each action, it's done for this reason, and that itself is done for another reason, and that itself is done for another reason, and so on and so forth. Now, in that case, remember, Aristotle can appeal to his theory of deliberation and say that the way deliberation works is that it transfers the desire for the end to the ultimate desire for the means. And so in the case where there's an infinite structure of ends, that transfer never happens, and so action never happens. And so in this case, this would be an empty case where action would never arise. So Aristotle says, but look, we do act for reasons, and so we're not in that case. Another challenge to his idea that there's a chief good is that there may be a lot of different ultimate ends. So you may swim for the reasons of health, you may go to the library for the reason of acquiring knowledge, and you may go to the ice cream shop for the reason of enjoying the pure pleasure of eating some good ice cream. Now, suppose it were the case that those goods were in a way each ultimate, and they, they were not organized into a overall good. Now, in that case, Aristotle said that he, Aristotle would think that human action in a way were neurotic, that there was all these different competing ends that we can never organize how we're going to do. And so we would, we would face these dilemmas where we would have one end that would require us to go one way and another end that would require us to go the other way, and it would be irresolvable. Now, the possibility of incommensurable ends, the possibility of there being no good that unifies all these things certainly is a possibility. I mean, this, this, you know, is discussed in the incommensurability literature, it's discussed in the literature on ethical dilemmas, and so on. Aristotle's view here, I think, is very optimistic, that he thinks, look, there, there you know, really aren't um, ethical dilemmas that arise from this situation in which there would be different ultimate ends. He thinks he has identified the ultimate end in action, and that's happiness. And so he would see these different competing goods, health, knowledge, and pleasure, as being parts of what the good life is, of what it is to be happy. So in Nicodemian Ethics, Book 1, Chapter 5, Aristotle discusses what were then taken to be conceptions of what ultimate happiness is, pleasure, money-making, and honor. Aristotle dismisses these fairly quickly. He says, look, pleasure isn't distinctive of the human logos, of the human form, because lower animals share in pleasure. Money-making, he thinks, is just an instrumental good. You make money in order to acquire something, and so it's not something that we desire for its own sake. If we do, we're, of, of course, we're confused. And then honor, he thinks, is uh, depends too much on people honoring you than on your being honorable. So here, I would encourage you to watch this video by David Foster Wallace on consumerism. I'll put a link to it in the description on YouTube. Okay, so now we turn to Aristotle's identification of what the distinctive human good is. Now what we get in Nicogamian Ethics Book 1, Chapter 7, in this passage that I have up here, is the function argument. Now let's just read the function argument and work through it because it is so important for Aristotle's view. So he writes, he says that to say that happiness is the chief good seems a platitude, and a clearer account of what it is is still desired. This might be given if we could first ascertain the function of a person. So we're after what is the form? What's the, so we're after here, what's the form of an individual? 
For just as for a flute player, a sculptor, or any artist, and in general for all things that have a function or activity, the good and the well is thought to reside in the function. So it would seem for a man if he has a function. So there, like when we think is what is the good? What's the what's the ethical? What's the what is the well for a flute player? And that is, you know, to develop the ability to play the flute well, similarly with a sculpture. And so Aristotle is thinking, well, if we can figure out what objective facts there are about a human individual, we can determine what their function is. And then what would be ethically appropriate for that person would be to do what is what fulfills that function, what's good, what is well of the individual. And he writes, has the carpenter then and the tanner certain functions and activity and the man has none? Is he naturally functionless? Or as I, hand, foot, and in general, each of the parts evidently has a function. May one lay it down that man similarly has a function apart from all these? What can this be? So he, he's thinking here, when we look at individual crafts and people and individual craftsmen, they have functions. And we look at the parts of people, they have functions. And so in a way, Aristotle could think, hey, it's surprising, right, that a person wouldn't have a function. Now, we've seen in earlier lectures, Aristotle has different arguments for thinking that animals have a function. I mean, there's the distinction between matter and form. And in the human person, there needs to be an active principle that forms that matter into what it is that makes a person. So let's continue here uh, reading. He says, life seems to be common even to plants. What we are seeking is distinctive to man. Let us exclude then the life of nutrition and growth, these powers of the soul that we had talked about last time of nutrition and growth. Next, there would be the life of perception, this other power of the soul. But it also seems common to even a horse, the ox, and every animal. There remains then an active life of the element that has a logos. Of this, one part has a principle in the sense of being obedient to one and the other sense of possessing one and exercising thought. And as this too can be taken in two ways, we must state that life in the sense of activity is what we mean. For this seems to be the more proper sense of the term. Now, if the function of man is an activity of the soul in accord with or not without logos. And if we say so-and-so and in a good so-and-so have a function which is the same kind, and so without qualification in all cases, eminence and respect of excellence being added to the function, if this is the case, human good turns out to be the activity of the soul in accord with excellence. So, all right, so what Aristotle has done here is he said, okay, let's think about the powers of the soul. What's distinctive to humans? And this is the power of the soul that has something to do with reasoning. So it's the power of the soul that lives in accord with logos, this principle of order. So Aristotle says that the function of man is the activity of the soul in accord with this logos. And the human good is this activity in accord with logos. That's what excellence is. And then he says, but we need to add in a complete life. For, he says, one swallow does not make a summer, nor does one day. And so too, one day or a short time does not make a man blessed and happy. So it's a complete life lived in accord with this rational principle. So that order, what it is to live accord with logos is excellence. That is virtue. So we can see a difference. I mean, Aristotle is thinking that this is an objective feature of human beings, that we can investigate human beings and we can discover what is the function of human beings. This isn't something that in a way is, is mysterious or hidden. We can, you know, Aristotle is thinking that a person is a part of nature. They differ from plants and animals in certain respects. And so it's an objective feature about persons, what power of the soul is distinctive of them and what it is to live a distinctive human life is to fulfill this function. And this function is a part of each and every person. So it's not as if, right, your function is going to differ from my function and so on. I mean, of course, there are going to be differences in different circumstances, but what leads to right, our flourishing is all the same. This is a point at which Aristotle differs from Sartre. So Sartre, you may know, is, is, is a French philosopher in the early part of the 20th century. He's known for this idea that existence precedes essence. The idea is that the individuality and subjectivity of an individual is prior to essence and that your individual, your individuality and your subjectivity, the, the power of that can determine whatever right, you want to be and the conditions of your flourishing or whatever 
they are depending on whatever character your subjectivity takes. Aristotle, by contrast, is thinking that essence precedes existence, that who you are as a human individual is that you're a member of the human species, and the human species has a particular good, and that good is a life lived in accord with a certain order in the soul. Okay, so there are two questions here about Aristotle's view that we want to investigate. So how is it possible to transcend your basic desires? So remember, like individuals have powers in the soul, so perception is one power. Um, and that is exercised. But also desire is a motive for action. And so we come with these basic desires for food and shelter and, and things of that nature. And so Aristotle wants to explain how it's possible to transcend basic desires and live accord with this rational principle. And the other question we have for Aristotle here is whether living in accord with distinctive human nature actually leads to happiness. Is this a satisfying life? If it turns out not to be a satisfying life, then Aristotle hasn't answered Plato's question that he's wrestling with early on, that Thrasymachus right, uh, gives him in Book 1 of the Republic. Why be moral? Why care about morality? So in order to answer these questions, let's think more about Aristotle's view of virtue. So virtue, on his view, are states of the soul that enable a person to live well. So let's look at this passage in Nicomachean Ethics, Book 2, Chapter 6. So there Aristotle writes, we must not only describe virtue as a state, but also say what sort of state it is. We may remark then that every virtue or excellence brings both into good condition the things of which it is the excellence and makes the work of that thing done well. For example, the excellence of the eye makes both the eye and its work good, for it is by the excellence of the eye that we see well. So here the idea is that virtue, it's a, it's a state that makes the thing of which it is a state good, but it also performs the activity well. Similarly, he says, the excellence of the horse makes both the horse good in itself and good at running and carrying its rider and awaiting the attack of the enemy. Therefore, if this is true in the case, the virtue of a man also will be a state which makes a man good and makes him do his work well. So Aristotle here is saying that the virtues not only make you an ethically good individual, but make you perform the task that you're doing particularly well. So then how are ethical virtues instilled? He thinks ethical virtues aren't instilled by lecture. You can't read a book and in a way become virtuous. Rather, they are acquired by habit. And habits are acquired sensitivities to act in certain circumstances. So let's look at this passage in Nicomachean Ethics, Book 2, Chapter 1. So he says, By doing the acts we do in our transactions with other men, we become just or unjust. By doing the acts we do in the presence of danger and being habituated to feel fear or confidence, we become brave or cowardly. The same is true of appetites and feelings of anger. Some men become temperate and good-tempered, others self-indulgent and irascible, by behaving in one way or the other in appropriate circumstances. So Aristotle is suggesting that if you want to acquire courage, do courageous acts, and that this, of course, is going to require practical wisdom, but you need to like, find a person that you think is courageous and model your actions on the basis of what they are doing. Thus, he says, in, in one word, states of character arise out of activities. This is why the activities we exhibit must be of a certain kind. It is because the states correspond to the differences between these. It makes no small difference, he says, whether we form habits of one kind or another from our very youth. It makes a very great difference, or rather all the difference. So here, Aristotle is, again, you know, um, picking up on a theme that Plato also focuses on is that good training in, in um, children and the youth are required because that's where your character is formed and your character is going to determine what kinds of pleasures and pains that you feel in certain kinds of actions and these are going to be the primary drivers of your future behavior. So I'll point you to Nicomachean Ethics Book 1 Chapter 8 where Aristotle talks about the relationship between good habits and pleasure and pain. Right, The idea is that good habits enable persons to experience pleasure from performing good acts. So Aristotle here is very optimistic about the prospects of individuals in engaging in ethical behavior. He thinks that someone who's able to realize his nature, to live in accord with this logos, this principle that orders one's soul, 
that that person will lead a rich, full, happy life, and he will experience a unity and harmony among his desires. This has an interesting implication when we'll talk about Aristotle's views on incontinence in the next lecture. So we might here wonder from a post-Freudian perspective whether Aristotle's optimism makes sense. So Freud, in his book Interpretations of Dreams, says a few things that conflict with Aristotle's optimism here. So he says that the virtuous man contents himself with dreaming that which the wicked man does in actual life. So this is a conflicted perspective for someone who would be virtuous if they're dreaming about what the wicked man does. And here the thought is that in a way dreamings are an expression of a kind of forbidden desire that the virtuous person would in a way want to, uh, would in a way want to, you know, engage in. And then Freud later says, unexpressed emotions will never die. They are buried alive and will come forth later in uglier ways. And so Freud has a very sort of pessimistic view is that if you're trying to habituate yourself to act well and you're not expressing certain kinds of emotions, that those emotions aren't going to dissipate. They're not going to in a way evaporate like water evaporates in the hot sun, that rather they will sort of go underground and there will be an aquifer of unexpressed emotion that will then become bubbling up in a, in a hot geyser. Uh, now, these are, what, what's interesting about this is these are claims, you know, that both Freud and, and uh, Aristotle are making and they have truth values. They could be true or false. I mean, it's, it, it isn't just taken that, you know, because Freud is writing at a later date that he's correct about unexpressed emotions. I mean, I don't know what the current literature is on this, but um, I would be shocked if there weren't a debate about whether or not unexpressed emotions die away. In any case, this is, this is in conflict with Aristotle's optimism. Aristotle thinks that the temperate person, the person who ha has become cultivated and, and we describe as an ethically good person, experiences no such conflict. So the ethical individual, right, isn't going to dream at night about what the wicked person does in actual life. The ethical person on Aristotle's view might consider those acts, but they would be repelled. They would be revulsed by those acts. Why on earth would I do these things that will harm me and you know my family and my friends? And similarly, the ethical person can look back on emotions that they used to have, and those emotions are no longer there. So this does get at another difference between Aristotle and our modern conception of action. So we tend to think that people are deserving of praise when they perform an action that conflicts with what their current desires are. Now Aristotle has a different means of evaluation. He thinks that, you know, praise and blame can be used in a way for growth and so maybe there's a sense in which we praise people who are developing into ethical individuals that they performed a good act when they did the kind of act that a, that a virtuous person would do even though they're pained by it. But he thinks that what is properly deserving of admiration is the individual who derives pleasure from doing good acts and derives pain from considering bad acts. And so this person is completely habituated to virtue so that in a way it is natural and effort. Okay, so what's required for virtuous action? So in Nicocomian Ethics, book two, chapter four, Aristotle lays out three conditions. So an agent must have practical knowledge. They need to know what to do in a particular circumstance. They must choose the action for its own sake. So in the case of courage, they need to know what courage requires in a particular circumstance. Maybe courage requires fiercely battling the enemy, or maybe courage in this circumstance requires that one retreat so that one can then engage the enemy at a different, at a different time or different location. And you have to choose the act because it's courageous. You can't choose it because, you know, it will gain one acclaim, for example. And another condition is that the action must flow from a firm character. We can think of someone like Achilles who would perform an action very similar to what Achilles would perform, but in a way that that person was just struck in that particular moment to do a similar act that Achilles performed in fighting, for example, against the Trojans. But that act would not be described as courageous for Aristotle because it doesn't flow from a firm character. Okay, so the practical knowledge that's required for virtue is known as phronesis. This knowledge is very much like a craftsman knowledge. It's very much like knowledge how, not propositional knowledge, because it's not knowledge that 
in a way, considers general rules and then applies them to a particular circumstance. It's a lot like perception in that one can see what the right thing is in this particular circumstance. Now, this knowledge, phronesis, isn't independent of one's character. So one has to develop ethical knowledge via habituation, and then phronesis. Phronesis is something that's developed alongside that habituation. So if we're looking for a way to characterize what phronesis is, we could say that it's a developed ability to judge the good and bad ends for a person and to choose the actions appropriate for securing those ends in the particular circumstances in life. There are a number of ends that one may be considering, and you have to have the ability to judge those ends and then to select the appropriate action for securing those ends given all the particulars of that circumstance. This is very difficult to acquire and it's acquired by going and finding someone who is virtuous and then living with them in a way so that you come to see things as they see things. So the practically wise person wishes for the best ends and then deliberates about how to achieve those. So again, this fits in with Aristotle's view of deliberation, is that the practically wise person has good desires, good ends, because they become habituated, and then they deliberate through phronesis of how to achieve these ends, and then the desire for the end transfers to the means of those ends. Okay, so this is an overview of Aristotle's ethical system. We'll continue to talk about Aristotle's ethics in the next lecture. So I encourage you again to go check out this video of David Foster Wallace on consumerism. This will give you, I think, a good picture of the way Aristotle is thinking about lower goods, such as pleasure and money-making and honor. So I'll see you next time.